Hello again. This video is all about trees, as I promised in the last one. And right now I'm standing beneath one of the, the largest and oldest trees on my little plot of land here in the west of Ireland. Um, it's a sycamore tree and I know it's at least 120 years old because speaking to some of my neighbours they've told me it predates the cottage and the cottage was built around uh, circa 1900. Um, so it's a fairly old tree, um, certainly old enough to reach maturity. Um, and being a sycamore tree, um, it's not native to Ireland. It's not a native species, which means at some point in history, someone has probably planted this tree, either as a seed or they've taken a sapling from somewhere and, and planted it deliberately. It's also right next to the lane, which would suggest it's been deliberately planted there. Um, I've no idea who that person was or when it was exactly, but they certainly were born of a very different age and time to the one that I live in. Um, I only wish that person could be here now to see what the tree has become and how mighty and, and, and beautiful it's become. Um, although standing underneath it at this point in time is, is a bit treacherous because um, it keeps depositing uh, balls of icy snow down my neck at regular intervals. There was one there. Um, as you can see, we had a dusting of snow last night and it's now all melting in the January sun. So obviously it's midwinter right now, um, but in the spring and summer months, this tree is an absolute haven of activity. Whether it's magpies nesting in the canopy or swallows darting between the branches, catching insects on the wing, um, or even the odd red squirrel. We still have red squirrels here in the west of Ireland and they occasionally come out from the forests that surround my land and you see them on the trees, um, including this one. It's also a fantastic climbing tree because it's got so many big boughs coming out and I love climbing. I used to be a, an avid rock climber and tree climbing is still one of my favourite things to do, even at my age. Um, and this big bough behind me that you can just see there is um, a wonderful um, kind of natural hammock that you can sit on on summer evenings and read a book or just laze in the in the evening sun. So it's a wonderful tree and it goes without saying I would never cut this tree down or um, prune it in any way. So this particular tree and there's several like this on my land um, is a beautiful mature specimen tree and that's the way it will stay. But this video is not about admiring the majesty and beauty of trees, even though that's something I love to spend a big part of my life doing, nor is it about, I should add, attempting to destroy them one branch at a time, as this fellow likes to spend his days doing. You can hear him chewing on one right now. Um, because when you move to uh, a small holding, a little piece of land in the country, you'll probably find that you have quite a few trees. Most of them will be along the hedgerows. Um, and if you intend to be self-sufficient, to provide for yourself as much as you can, uh, whether it's growing food or heating your home um, or even keeping animals, then you will find that um, trees and managing those trees are fundamental. He's actually chewing on a little sapling there right now, as you can see. That won't last very long. Um, but you will find that trees are pretty fundamental to your ability to, um, to do that, to be self-sufficient. And that's what this video is about. It's about how to manage your trees in the best way, at least the best way that I've figured out, um, for the purpose of self-sufficiency, whilst also being sustainable. So this is what my hedgerows look like. A mixture of blackthorn and hawthorn, this is a hawthorn tree right here next to me. Um, and that's generally planted, I think, as a stock-proof barrier um, because it keeps cattle out and sheep. And then we've got willow. There's a, a small willow tree just off camera. Um, there's plenty of willow along the, the hedgerows here as well. And I think willow is, is mostly planted because it copes very well with waterlogged soil. It's great in damp soils and it grows very quickly as well. So it's good for filling gaps um, in areas where not many other species of tree would grow, certainly not quickly. 
and also elder. There's a huge amount of elder on my land and you can see a big elder tree up there. Um, and I think the main reason elder is planted um, or was planted um, was because it produces beautiful flowers and berries which are used traditionally to make wine, elderflower wine um, or poor man's champagne as I've heard it called. Um, and elderberry wine as well is, is delicious. Um, and I think making wine would have been a much more common practice um, in times of old than it is now, um, especially when you think people didn't have supermarkets that they could just pop down and, and buy a bottle or two for the weekend. So they would have had to make their own if they wanted alcohol. And if you leave hedgerows like this alone for decades, as mine have been, then the trees will eventually put out branches that sucker into the ground, um, sending roots down and growing up new trees, just as uh, strawberry plants do. Um, and of course, um, from the countless thousands of seeds they produce every year, uh, many will germinate. Um, there's an absolute mass of little seedlings. I don't know if you can see down there. All of these uh, are young um, willow trees that have germinated from um, the trees above them. This is actually a mixture of willow and uh, hawthorn that's growing together, this hedgerow. Um, so there's no natural predators here to graze them. There's no wild deer. Um, I guess if they were growing in a, a field that was grazed by cows or, or horses, they might be um, kept in check. But on my land, there's nothing like that. So what happens if you leave the hedgerows alone is the shrubby kind of grassy areas um, are gradually taken over by the trees. It's a process called succession um, in which the land, if left alone, returns to its most efficient native state, um, which in the case of a temperate country like Ireland is, of course, woodland. But if you want to be self-sufficient, as I do, and you have limited land um, to do it on, I only have about an acre of growing space here, then you need to manage that process. Because if you don't, then you'll have no land to keep animals on, you'll have nowhere to grow food, be it um, annuals, perennials, or even things like fruit bushes and trees. Um, and the areas of land that you do have will be in constant shade, which means that photosynthesis will be limited, which means that you'll get a poor harvest every year. So managing trees, is a pretty fundamental process when you're living on a small holding trying to be self-sufficient. It might sound really romantic to just let everything grow and have this kind of wild abundance, but in practical real terms it just doesn't happen like that. So when I first moved here I made a really detailed plan of the land, mapping out every square meter where I was going to plant trees and um, build ponds and polytunnels and um, where my growing beds would be for vegetables. The whole thing was planned precisely. And I can honestly say in the last two and a half years since I moved here, I've made more revisions to that um, plan than I have trips to town. It's a constantly evolving thing. And I didn't expect that before I moved here. I knew there would be some changes, obviously, but um, my plan was quite intelligent, you know, it was, it was based on um, things I'd read and researched about the correct orientation to have um, your, your polytunnel in so that it's facing north to south so it gets the right, um, the path of the sun during the day. You know, principles like that which I thought would apply universally. But I'm really grateful for that two and a half years because during that time, I've learned so much about how to best manage this piece of land, this unique space on the planet. Um, and if I'd just come here with lots of money to throw at doing things quickly with diggers and tractors and builders, then I wouldn't have had that opportunity to learn those things. I would have just been forcing the land and nature to do what I wanted. And I'm, as I say, I'm really grateful for that time. Um, one of the principles actually of, of permaculture, which is a subject very, very close to my heart and something I hope to make videos about in the future, is that you should live on a piece of land for at least a year, preferably more than that, so that you can see how it works from one season to the next. You can see where, for instance, the frost pockets are. 
you can see the areas that trap heat and light. You can see the areas that are particularly vulnerable to strong winds. Um, so you can understand how that piece of land works before you make any changes to it. And that's something that I really, really advise anyone else who's coming to a project like this to do. So another fundamental principle of permaculture is this idea that you should work with nature rather than trying to fight against it. Um, and that's where coppicing comes in when it comes to woodland. Um, and coppicing is what I've been doing here to this area, um, which was a hedgerows up there and it's kind of spread down across this land over the decades and taken over a rather large area. Um, and coppicing is where you cut trees at about a metre high, um, but you don't damage the root structure, you don't um, do anything to the soil, you just cut them at about a metre and then you let them regrow from that stump. Um, and it works fantastically well with any kind of broadleaf tree. So the kind of trees that you find in hedgerows, um, any trees that lose their leaves in the winter will, will coppice. It won't work with pine trees, spruce trees, coniferous trees basically um, and that's because they have a very strong apical dominance which means if you cut the tip off they won't the side shoots won't take over um, but for hedgerow species it's a fantastic way to manage those trees and indeed it's something that's been going on for thousands of years and um, it was the main way that people managed small woodlands um, for resources like firewood you don't really hear too much about coppicing these days because um, in commercial forestry, everything's just clear felled. It's clear felled spruce and pine. Um, so it's not really applicable to that. But on a small holding like this, it's the absolute best way, I think, to manage woodland. So here's a tree that I coppiced last year. Um, and you can see that in the space of one growing season, we've got all these um, shoots that have come up from tiny dormant um, lateral buds around the the stem, the, the trunk of the tree. Um, and there's a, actually a whole row of these um, elder trees along here, which I coppiced back like this. Um, and at the time, I wasn't sure if I'd have to remove them entirely um, or if I could keep them like that, keep them coppiced. But I've since realized that actually leaving them coppiced is the absolute best thing to do. Um, and there are several reasons for that. First of all, Coppicing a tree doesn't kill it. It doesn't really harm it. Um, it actually resets it to an earlier stage of growth. So you might say actually that coppicing is kind of the secret to eternal youth when it comes to trees. Um, and they don't have a nervous system, so they don't feel pain. Um, they just keep growing. In, in fact, it kind of, coppicing induces this hit of hormones, which causes the tree to um, stimulate growth from these the side buds. Um, so if I just left this alone now, these shoots would just continue to grow and eventually it would um, turn back into a full-size tree. But that's not what I intend to do with the coppiced trees along this row. Um, I'm actually going to make use of these um, shoots and I'm going to talk a bit about that uh, later on. But um, there's another really useful advantage as well of coppicing. And that's that if the particular tree produces um, a fruit that you can use, in the case of these elder trees, they produce flowers and berries, which uh, my chickens absolutely love, and potentially I could make into wine at some point as well. Um, then instead of being way, way up there, um, five, six, seven meters up where I can't possibly reach them, um, they're down here where I can reach them. So it makes the fruit of the tree much more accessible. Um, and of course, the tree has a lot of energy because the root system isn't being harmed at all. So it's still able to absorb just as much uh, in the way of nutrients from the soil and just as much moisture is coming up through those roots. Um, but instead of being spread throughout um, a large five, six meter high tree, that, that energy is being concentrated into a smaller area. So you tend to get, I've noticed, a more intense um, harvest of, of fruit on coppice trees like this. I 
And here's another really impressive tree on my land. This is actually an ash tree. And it's a huge tree. You can see how high it is there. Um, it kind of looks like it's in leaf, but those are actually all um, ivy vines climbing up that um, stay in, in leaf during the winter. So it keeps it nice and green. Um, but the really cool thing about this tree is that it has been coppiced um, a long, long, long time ago. I would imagine at least 50 or 60 years, uh, maybe even a lot longer than that. Um, someone has come along and cut it kind of at this sort of level and it's then been left. So the shoots that have come up, and you can see them here, there's a few more on the other side, they've all just regrown. Um, and if ever you needed proof that coppicing a tree doesn't harm it, um, then this, this has got to be it. So I also have a theory that by coppicing my elder and blackthorn, hawthorn trees and allowing the low branches to produce fruit, that, the low shoots that regrow from the stump, that these guys, my chickens, will be able to hop about on them and feed themselves directly from the trees, which obviously they wouldn't be able to do if the fruit was five or six meters up. Um, it's yet to be proven <laughs> so it's definitely still a theory at this point, but they are jungle birds, so I don't see why they wouldn't um, do that. And, you know, they do like to climb about on, on low branches. So next autumn, I'm going to release them out into some of these areas where I've coppiced um, trees, and I'm going to see if I can kind of encourage them to climb up and um, feed themselves a, a vitamin-rich berry feast. Um, direct from the tree. So if it works, I won't have to do any work at all. So here I am sat on my hammock branch up the sycamore tree, which you saw earlier. Um, I definitely wouldn't advise tree climbing when it's been snowing, uh, especially if you have to haul a camera up with you. Um, but the view is pretty spectacular, so I thought it would make a good spot to film the last part of this video. Um, I want to talk briefly about why I think it's a bad idea to um, kill trees entirely um, or to try and pull up the roots. Firstly, um, if you have to use heavy machinery, diggers, tractors, which you probably will, then um, you're going to compact the soil. And compacted soil, first of all, it's bad for anything else that you intend to plant there um, because the new roots will find it very, very hard to penetrate down into that soil. And secondly, Compacted soil encourages flooding um, because the water, the surface water, can't run down, can't penetrate into the, the soil. Um, so you just tend to get this kind of puddling effect on the surface, um, like you would on your drive, basically. So the other reason really not to um, kill trees and pull up roots entirely is that you're going to really damage the soil structure. And we all know that most of the nutrients in soil are in the top um, a few centimetres, um, something like 70-80% of all the nutrient value is in the surface layer of the soil. So if you're pulling up huge tree roots, you're going to disrupt the structure of that soil, um, which obviously isn't a good thing for it if you intend to plant more um, things there. Um, you're also breaking any symbiotic relationships that might be going on between the tree that you're removing and other trees or plants in the area. There's all sorts of things I've been learning about on my courses where trees release hormones into the soil and they fix nitrogen and there's all sorts of stuff going on that we don't really fully understand yet. Um, so if you're trying to manage nature and not dominate it, um, then, you know, isn't it better to um, be sympathetic to a life form rather than just try and kill it because it, it's kind of in your way? Um, again, this comes back to permaculture, you know, I think it's better to work with nature um, and if that means you can keep a tree alive and even utilize that tree in a different form um, for the sake of self-sufficiency whilst also being sustainable, then that's got to be a win-win situation, hasn't it? So that's it for part one of this video. Um, there is going to be a second part. I had intended to film it all as one, but um, I think it would be a bit too long if I did that, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. 
Um, the next part is going to be all about utilising the resources that come from a coppice tree. Um, not only will they heat your home in a very sustainable way, but they'll also give back life to everything on your land, um, be it plants or animals. Um, it's a fantastic resource that's absolutely invaluable if you want to be self-sufficient. Um, for the moment though, it's freezing cold and if I stay out here any longer my nose is going to start running so I'm going to clamber down this tree and head back into my cosy caravan and have some lunch. But I'll see you in part two. Bye for now. Because when you move to uh, a temperate part of the world like Ireland, um, the chances are you'll probably have a lot of trees. <laughs> it's mostly used as a stockproof barrier because obviously it's very thorny. And that's some sort of squabble going on in the chicken house. Not sure if you heard that. So another principle of permaculture is that you should work with nature rather than trying to fight against it, um, which is definitely something I try and do here when it comes to my woodland. Um, I want to talk about coppicing because coppicing, thank you Moss, thank you. Um, another reason that um, killing trees entirely is probably a bad idea um, is that I've completely forgotten 